I spoke personally with President Rouhani of Iran earlier this fall. Secretary Kerry has met multiple times with Iran's foreign minister. And we have pursued intensive diplomacy bilaterally with the Iranians and together with our P5 plus one partners. The United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China, as well as the European Union. Today, that diplomacy opened up a new path toward a world that is more secure, a future in which we can verify that Iran's nuclear program is peaceful and that it cannot build a nuclear weapon. While today's announcement is just a first step, it achieves a great deal. For the first time in nearly a decade, we have halted the progress of the Iranian nuclear program. Says he. Welcome aboard, everyone. Steve Malsberg kicking off a short week, Thanksgiving week, but a busy week nonetheless. Uh, this was Saturday night. We heard that there was going to be a, uh, what, 1015 a presidential announcement. And of course, it didn't happen until 1035 uh, in true Obama fashion. Anyway, uh, an agreement signed, an agreement reached. Joining us now to talk about this. Uh, what I believe and many others believe to be a, a disaster on all levels is Rich Lowry, columnist, editor at the National Review and author of Lincoln Unbound. Hey, Rich. Hey, how's it going? Good to talk to you again. Appreciate Likewise. you coming on. All right. So, um, you know, I haven't heard anybody uh, outside of uh, the Ayatollah and the president of Iran and uh, Obama's administration uh, speak positive of this. Yeah, it's... Um... Uh, it doesn't seem to be a very good trade, to say the the least. Uh, and the the one piece of good news you can take from this is it was a sign that the sanctions were really biting, something that some of us were skeptical of. But the Iranians wouldn't even want to go along with the charade unless they kind of felt compelled to. So it would seem to me the most obvious play would have been just to keep the sanctions on until you get some real concessions from the Iranian it's Iranians and, and get them to cease their program. This is just a pause where you uh, lift some of the sanctions in a way that's um, likely to lead to a loss of momentum on that front. And will the Iranians are now in a position where they can continue with the relaxed sanctions and kind of string us along. Yeah, and uh, by the way, uh, the reports today are that uh, $8 billion in Iranian assets have been unfrozen by the United States, so that speaks to your point. Now, you know, um, the uh, foreign minister of Iran gets on uh, national TV and says that uh, in two places in the agreement, specifically, it says that we can continue to enrich uranium. It is our right. And then Kerry gets on the uh, George Stephanopoulos show and says, uh, no, it doesn't. So, I mean, that's not only, that's not a minor sticking point. That's a major, major portion of this whole deal. And here already, not even 24 hours after the agreement is signed, they disagree on the most important part of the agreement. Yeah, and Kerry is being very uh, legalistic there. I mean, there's nothing that says in the agreement and bright blinking, blinking lights, oh, the Iranians can continue to enrich. But the fact is, they can't continue to enrich. It doesn't stop their enriching uh, uranium to uh, this kind of lower level. And um, they'll keep doing that and keep spinning their centrifuges and, and take that as an implicit concession that they have a right to do it. And the fact is, we're very likely going down a path here where the Iranians will get a bomb or get very close to having a bomb. And our policy will be what the president has denied it's going to be for so long, which is uh, trying to contain a nuclear Iran. Right. Absolutely. Now, uh, when it comes to Israel, um, you know, Israel, Saudi Arabia have reportedly been talking and uh, the, Israel reportedly has gone to the Saudi bases. Uh, but uh, there's also been talk that behind the scenes, uh, the United States has threatened to, uh, I, I, I'll use the word sabotage, any attempt by Israel or Saudi Arabia or anybody else who's ticked off about this in the Gulf uh, to, uh, to take uh, their own action. Yeah, well, it puts Israel in a very tough spot because now it would really appear to be the international spoiler crossing its main patron, the United States, if it were going to take action in these circumstances. So I find it hard to believe uh, that they will, at least in the, the next six months. But you can understand why, they, why they're furious and why the Arab states are furious. As someone was saying on TV today, uh, I think Joe Scarbo actually, <laughs> this is, maybe this is a sign the president does deserve his peace prize because he's gotten the Arabs and the Israelis to finally agree on something on what a disastrous policy is. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. The great uniter yeah. finally united somebody, right? The Israelis and the Saudis. Go figure that. Now, Rich, uh, we're talking to Rich Lowry, uh, editor of National Review, also a columnist there and author of Lincoln Unbound, great uh, book that uh, has been out for uh, about a month or so. We had Rich on when it came out. How much of this is I see is a diversion to Obamacare? See, I don't. I, the reports are uh, Associated Press reporting today that these talks have been going on behind the scenes for a year. So I don't know how much of it, maybe the timing is a diversion, uh, but what do you think? I don't think it's a diversion. I think it's something he really desperately wanted to do from the very beginning. You go back to that debate with Hillary where he said he wanted to talk, have direct talks with all our our most bitter enemies and adversaries, Iran and Chavez and all the rest of them. So this is something that is really close to his core that he believes is good foreign policy. You know, he believes the United States and its kind of assertiveness around the globe has been the problem in the world and why we're so hated. So he wants to extend a hand. And uh, again, I don't think he fears an Iranian bomb the way some other folks do, and it's another classic kind of misdirection. We learned from the healthcare debate that this administration really runs on bad faith and is afraid to admit what its really its real goals are. And in this case, uh, it ultimately is fine with accepting an Iranian bomb, but just can't say that out loud. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, um, domestically, he's out in San Francisco today pushing immigration reform. And by the way, reminding everybody that he got uh, Osama bin Laden. Swear to God, just before he came on. He, uh, by the way, I, I got bin Laden. So uh, he's really digging deep. But um, yesterday in Seattle at a fundraiser, he called the Republicans an impediment. Um, to uh, to you know success uh, on his part his agenda now he's pushing immigration reform but you know what he won't get immigration reform put it this way whether he gets it in the Congress or not he'll get it because he'll just order yeah. whatever he wants yeah now there's some limits to how far he can go on that but yeah you're absolutely right and you know at one point a couple months ago this is why Marco Rubio is saying he's promoting the Gang of Eight bill because he thought President Obama would just oppose it by executive order I I oppose the the bill and think that's a pretty rotten justification for it, but it gives you an idea of where this administration is coming from. Um, I I doubt we're going to see anything uh, big on immigration, but for those of us uh, who oppose oppose it, we have to keep banging away. And, you know, nothing, he clearly, you know, wants to pivot to jobs or pivot to immigration reform or pivot to something besides the health care law, but that's really impossible. I mean, the health care law is just too gargantuan an issue with too many real-world effects on millions of people out there, and the president can talk about whatever he wants, but uh, if your plan is getting canceled or your premiums are going up, you're not going to want to change the topic. And, and one more, um, the uh, nuclear option, which took place, of course, uh, last week, um, I mean, the frightening part is that uh, these left-wing judges, I mean, radical left-wing judges in many cases, will be on that bench or the, the various courts for 40 years. And uh, Obama's uh, legacy, uh, radical as it is, will live on long after he's uh, out of the White House. Yeah, and there's a particular focus on the D.C. Circuit, which the Obama administration was claiming was desperately overworked, so was desperately in need of his new appointment. Which it's not, of course. Which, which it isn't, and it has basically a four-to-four balance, and he wants to tip it his way because that's the circuit that's going to hear a lot of these challenges to his regulatory uh, maneuvers and his executive actions. So it's more important to pack that court than any other in the country, and I think that was probably the most important factor behind the nuclear option. Rich, great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks you too. Take care. Rich Lowry, ladies and gentlemen, columnist uh, and, more importantly, editor <laughs> at the National Review uh, here on the Steve Malzberg Show, his book, Lincoln Unbound. Um, when we come back, I want to play some sound bites for you. I want you to hear the contradiction between the uh, Iranian foreign minister and John Kerry. And uh, still ahead in this hour, we'll have Mark Halperin, who is uh, going to talk. Uh, he's, of course, the, uh, the co author of Double Down Game Change 2012, MSNBC, and Time Magazine. Michael Barone will be here later in the show. Caroline Glick, Ralph Peters, David Horowitz, Doug Schoen, Richard Grinnell, Bill Crystal. Is that enough to satisfy your political want? I hope so. Uh, we're coming back. Steve Malzberg show right here on Newsmax TV and radio.